something as, as including metabolic disorder present at birth. This defect of prenatal origin result from defective embryogenesis or intrinsic abnormalities in the developmental process. WHO report about 3 million infants born each year with major congenital anomalies, and the prevalence of congenital anomalies varies greatly from country to country. The most common serious congenital disorder, including congenital heart defect, neural tube defect, and Down syndrome. Seen as anomalies not the most common type of congenital malformation, but have a serious effect on affected individual and the family quality of life. One third of all prenatal anomalies are seen as malformation. So, accurate prenatal diagnosis is important for family counseling regarding recurrence risk. Technological development in the diagnostic imaging have improved the diagnosis and the treatment of a congenital anomalies, especially in the setting of the neural tube defect. The primary imaging method for evaluating the fetus is ultrasonography, including the assessment of a fetal brain, being more safe for both mother and the fetus, affordable, and allowing real-time imaging and widely available and because of its proven effectiveness, widespread availability, and low cost, ultrasound is the most commonly used technology for a fetal imaging. Despite being the most commonly screening modality, it has some limitations, including a small field of view, limited soft tissue acoustic contrast, beam attenuation by adipose tissue, and poor image quality in case of oligohydramnus. And there is a specific limitation regarding the CNS anomalies, including limited visualization of the posterior fossa in advanced gestation due to calivarial calcification. Although ultrasound remains the predominant modality for evaluating a disorder related to pregnancy, fetal MRI has increasingly used, especially in CNS anomalies. Even though MRI is a non-invasive technology, it should only be used when ultrasound can to provide enough information for family counseling, a neutral intervention, or delivery planning. And I will talk in a brief about the fetal MRI technique, what is the advantage of fetal MRI, including excellent tissue contrast, large field of view, better view of the relationship between the lesion and the adjacent structure, offer a greater independent imaging in a number of different plans less affected by maternal habits and the fetal position and oligohydramnus. And one of the frequently asked questions about the fetal MRI, is it safe during a pregnancy or not? MRI is a non-invasive technique using non-ionizing gradation with no negative side effect. And ECR reported that MRI can be done at any stage of pregnancy if the ultrasound is inadequate. And despite the MRI can be done at any stage of pregnancy, the preferred timing is the second or a third trimester of a pregnancy between 18 to, 30 week, to 36 gestational week, as before we suffer from a small size fetus and the motion and the fetal motion. And most organ can be seen in detail between 26 to 32 gestational week for better assessment of a disease of a cortical malformation in case of a brain anomalies. Some technical consideration you should take uh, in our consideration, including we use 1.5 Tesla machine or less, and any pulse sequence should be obtained during a maternal breast holding without fetal or maternal sedation. And we instruct the mother to fast for about four hours before the exam to decrease the bowel peristalsis, and they instructed to empty their bladder prior to the exam to be more comfort. And during the examination, they ask it to lie subine position or lift the lateral decubitus position in a late trimester. The most common pulse sequence for fetal MRI, including single shot fastest beam echo sequence, it is the gold standard in the fetal MRI because of excellent fetal tissue contrast resolution. And also we use a steady state free precision sequence which can display fluid in a motion as a high signal intensity structure, so provides similar image quality to single shot fastest beam echo sequence, especially for a brain imaging in a second trimester. And we use also T1 weighted MRI image because of the T1 hyper intensity of a certain tissue and organ, it used to detect hammer and decalcification and detection of a fatty lesion. 
And one of the advanced techniques we use in a fetal MRI, including diffusion-weighted imaging, which is very sensitive for detecting ischemic lesion and the brain lesion, and assess the maturational process of the cerebral cortex and white matter, so have a many application for both developmental and destructive brain process. And also we use MR spectroscopy, provide prognostic confirmation on the brain function by detected elevated creatinine content and estimated the risk of hypoxia. Now, what are the main indications of fetal MRI in case of the brain anomalies? Either to confirm the brain abnormalities suspected by brain-natal ultrasound or used to identify any additional sonographically occult CNS abnormalities, including agenist of the corpus callosum, posterior fossa abnormalities, or cortical malformation. Fetal MRI, fetal brain, is a dynamic structure. So it is important for each radiologist to be familiar with the normal appearance of the fetal brain at a different gestational age to be able to identify and characterize abnormalities with the fetal uh, MRI. Now, what is the normal MRI anatomy of the supratentorial brain? MRI of the normal fetal cerebrum characterized initially by presence of a smooth surface and the large ventricle, followed as the brain matures the sulci form. Then different layering patterns are observed in the fetal brain MRI depending on the gestational age. In early gestation, cerebral parenchyma is differentiating into three layers. Germinal matrix layer appearing as a dark T2 signal, cortical plate layer appearing as a high T2 signal, and in between it is intermediate layer appearing as a low T2 signal. Then, followed by five layer pattern, which is seen between 20 to 28 gestational week from medial to lateral appearing as a ventricular zone and germinal matrix zone appearing as a dark T2 signal, followed by periventricular zone appearing as a high T2 signal and intermediate zone which will show low T2 signal and sublate high T2 signal and the cortical zone appearing as a dark T2 signal. Then, the multi-layered appearance mature to typical postnatal brain MRI appearance after 28 gestational week and demyelination can be seen at a 22 to 40 gestational week. Also, knowledge of the timing of the appearance of a sulci is important for proper interpretation of the fatal brain development. As early as a 34 week gestational week, sulcation is, is complete and appears similar to the adult. Generally, the primary sulcus first develop, appearing as a shallow infolding on the surface of the brain in early gestation. With the progression of gestational age, it become more deeper. And the pathologists consider brain sulcation are the most accurate way to detect to de a pregnancy. So, knowledge of the gestational age is critical when assessing the sulcation pattern. And MRI can report a change in the morphology and a change in a signal based on a T1 and a T2 weighted sequence in the form of developing a sulcation, decreasing in subarachnoid space, and thinning of the periventricular germinal zone. And the change in the signal are related to cellular differentiation and organization, myelin deposition, and a decrease in the water content in the white matter. And also, we can bitterly assess the corpus callosum. Corpus callosum develop between 8 to 20 gestational week. So MRI should be done after 20 gestational week if we want to assess the corpus callosum, which directly visualized and measured in the midline sagittal fetal MRI as a band of a low signal in Tennessee superior to the fornix. And also we can assess the ventricle and the measured it as the level of the atrium. And MRI help to assess the shape of the entire ventricular system, assessing the wall of the lateral ventricle. So what is the main pathology of a supratentorial brain? Including the ventriculomegaly, which is the common indication for a second trimester fetal MRI, as fetal MRI can detect additionally sonographically occult CNS abnormality in about 40 to 50 percent of the cases. And the MRI help to differentiate between severe ventriculomegaly from other disease like hydranencephaly and holobrosencephaly. Ventriculomegaly is a diagnosed when the width of the atrium is more than 10 millimeters. 
Other pathology including hollow broad encephaly. It is a spectrum of a disorder characterized by incomplete cleavage of broad encephalon, which form the cortex and salami, and range from a luber to semi-luber to luber hollow broad encephaly variant. As we see here, this is a case of a luber hollow broad encephaly in which there is absence of a midline cleavage, leading to fused salami and the basal ganglia and the monoventricle. In a semi luber time, it is a less severe form with some cleavage, usually posteriorly, and variable separation of the salami. And one of the least form of the whole present kephali variant is a septo-optic dysplasia characterized by absent cavum safety velocity, fused of both frontal whole of lateral ventricle and intact interhemispheric fissure. And also, one uh, other pathologies, including callosal anomalies, which is common association with the ventriculomegaly, ranging from agenesis to hypoplasia. And the fetal MRI have a great sensitivity for a detection of a callosal agenesis, including absent of a, key, absent of a corpus callosum in a sagittal or a coronal plane after 20 gestational weeks and other indirect sign, including absence of a cavum septi velocity, parallel configuration of both lateral ventricle, colpocephalic configuration of occipital horn of both lateral ventricle, associating with midline lipoma or interhemispheric cyst. And the more than 75% of the fetus with callosal agenesis have other associating brain anomalies, including posterior fossa anomalies and the brain stem hypoplasia. Also, one of the associations with the ventriculomegaly is a cortical malformation, and it can be identified in MRI by noting alteration in normal sulcation pattern from a fetus at a particular gestational age. It might be polymicrogyry, lysencephaly, or schizencephaly. To diagnose lysencephaly, the examination must be done late in pregnancy after 30 gestational weeks, appearing as a smooth brain with abnormally thick and multi-layer pattern and the absence of expected sulcation for each gestational hydrocephalus, including the vein of gallium malformation and the dural venal sinus thrombosis, and also bilateral internal carotid artery occlusion, which leading to what is called hydran encephaly. It is most of the supratentural parenchyma replaced by fluid. And the MRI can differentiate hydran encephaly from other causes like severe hydrocephalus and holobrosencephaly. And the most common indication of fetal MRI regarding the posterior fossa including assess the size of the cisternae magna, insertion of the tentorium, the size and the morphology of the ribellum and the vermis, and the shape of the fourth ventricle and the morphology of the bones. Now, what is the normal development of the posterior fossa? Cerebellum developed first, followed by cerebrum, and the vermis completes development at 18 gestational week. At 21 gestational weeks, the cerebellum appears as multi-layer pattern with a central area of T2 hypointensity and T1 hyperintensity. And also, we can assess the normal cisterna magna, which should be between 2 to 10 millimeter on axial image. And also, we can measure the transcerebral diameter, which assesses the cerebellar size based in the gestational age. And the transcerebral diameter usually not affected by other, by other fetal abnormalities, as in case of gross restriction. Now, what is the main pathology of posterior fossa anomalies, including either small cisterna magna less than 2 millimeter, as in case of KRE2 malformation, or dilated cisterna magna more than 10 millimeter, as in case of a dandy walker malformation, vermian hypoplasia, mega cisterna magna, plux pouch cyst, or arachnoid cyst. MRI is very useful in KRE2 malformation to assess the severity of hind brain herniation, ventricular size and the morphology, the level of spinal dystrophism, and excluding other associating developmental brain abnormalities. Then the Walker spectrum, it is a spectrum of abnormality related to the roof of rhombencephalon. And the outcome are highly variable from normal cognition to severely affected cases and correlated to the degree of a vermian hypoplasia and other associating abnormalities. And there are genetic associations, including Michael Gruber syndrome. In case of mega cisterna magna, we notice there is increase in CSF spaces posteriorly to the normally formed cerebellum, not communicating with the fourth ventricle with no mass effect on the vermis. In case of Balak's about cyst, there is CSF cyst 
communicating with the fourth ventricle, exerting a mass effect on the vermis, but still the vermis is normally formed. In case of classical Dandy Walker malformation, there is an enlarged posterior fossa communicating with the fourth ventricle associating with the vermian agenesis or hypoplasia and the superiorly displaced tentorium. And in case of posterior fossa arachnoises, it is extra axial cyst not communicating with the fourth ventricle, exerting mass effect on the posterior fossa structure and is off a midline. So, our take home message include Ultrasound is the primary screening imaging modality for assessment of the congenital brain anomalies. Fetal MRI is indicated in case of inconclusive ultrasound finding. Fetal MRI imaging may demonstrate additional findings that may alter the patient counseling, case management, especially in high-risk pregnancy. Radiologists must know normal brain development and have an accurate gestational age in order to correctly interpret the fetal MRI. Fetal MRI is a safe technique with no negative side effect on the mother on the or fetus, especially when using 1.5 Tesla machine or less. And due to development of ultra-fast sequence of fetal MRI, no need for maternal or fetal sedation. Thank you for attention.